do uh, want to recognize Dr. Frakes and then just share a little bit about him. So Dr. Frakes is an assistant athletic director for sports nutrition with extensive experience in performance nutrition. His current role supports the strategic nutrition directions for all student athletes on campus and is the director of football nutrition. His research interests include the effects of nutrition on the athletic performance and concussion recovery. He has presented at various conferences and events. His doctoral studies focused on the impact of dietary intake and adequate energy consumption on concussion recovery and symptom reduction in student athletes. And so that's what I have, but Dr. Frakes can probably share the extensive amount of leadership and um, uh, education and experience that he's been able to do with this, um, specifically the specialty of sports nutrition. But thank you, Dr. Frakes, for uh, being with us this evening. And I'll go ahead and let you take over now. Absolutely, appreciate you. Um, so from my experience with everything, uh, I can I probably work with football now. I worked with a lot of Olympic sports as far as in the past. So with men's, women's basketball, baseball, um, volleyball, men's soccer, and then also with my concussion research, um, anyone that was unfortunately that had the experience of that. So whenever you have any questions at all whatsoever, uh, feel free to ask them in the demands of what your team needs are and what your athlete needs are. And we will definitely meet those needs. And then I, and actually I'll provide any resources you need at all whatsoever uh, to continue further in as far as and exploring more information and research that you need for your demands, especially as it grows for your business too. Um, so with that said, these are the main three uh, books I suggest as well. If you have not already done so, uh, putting these into your bookshelves um, as a resource to actually dive into but then also look further into the references that's actually provided within these resources um, between the biochemical basis of sports performance. So this will give a definite justice of what the energy demands for your sport and actually how to look further in detail and what sports performance is seeing from the metabolic efficiency and metabolic demands that you need to meet and prescribe as dietitians. And then also obviously between the clinical sports nutrition manual and also the sports nutrition handbook, the sports nutrition handbook will have a new edition um, that will come out within the near future. Um, I actually wrote a chapter in there as well. So that'd be great because it will provide more what our jobs and duties are and defining those roles in a organization perspective, but then also in a university perspective and what to look further into rather than, um, not rather than, but more so, okay, we have our practitioners in private practice, but now making our jobs a little bit more efficient, easier and well-defined in this space. Then obviously the clinical sports nutrition manual as well, which you can say is the Bible, if you will, within for sports dietitians. Um, that will provide everything that you need as far as for lab assessments, um, analyses, management, operations, everything that you need in that standpoint there. Uh, so within our objectives that we're going to meet here, uh, we're going to look at the key principles of sports nutrition, uh, how we're going to determine calorie needs of different types of athletes and sports, and then also uh, understanding energy balance and macronutrient requirements for athletic performance. And then also I want to touch more so on um, um, low energy availability um, and red S, if you will. Uh, so that way we can start thinking in that mindset and pattern for depending on what athletes you may have risk of and then how to navigate and start discussing with and putting on your team uh, an expert within that space as well. Instead of relying on just your sole expertise to do so, it's always great to bring in as far as somebody, not only that if they trust you, but if you have someone that specializes in that space to bring them on board. So these are the areas that you have to realize that are going to be um, something that impacts your uh, interventions and what you do as a practitioner. So the social uh, factors, meal patterns, availability, uh, marketing, culture, religion, psychological factors, which how they see themselves and, and how they perform their sport. The coaches are all the ways uh, harping on them or discussing with them their idea of weight in relation to how they need to perform. Um, any, depending on what stage, conference, um, level of play, uh, age group that you're working with, 
cost and income and economic uh, stability is going to be a factor in their choices and selections as well. Uh, also psychological and biological. So this is where a lot of our um, expertise comes in because we need to navigate this area to help support any performance outcomes or outcomes in general. So food allergies, food intolerances, um, any uh, body composition, which we'll discuss later, fat-free mass, and also adipose tissue that, that is present in relation to sport performance, hunger and appetite, uh, taste preferences and food preferences, and also gastrointestinal discomfort. Uh, which is definitely going to be one that you need to also uh, what I like to call train the gut, if you will, from timing, because they train at different times, they play in different times. So you'll need to make sure that you train that individual to eat certain foods during certain times to get the best outcomes for their actual sport. And if you consume certain things too much of may actually impact their performance in their sport too. Uh, lifestyle beliefs and knowledge is definitely going to be one as well. So, because this is a driving factor on what they do to make the decision in order to uh, participate in their sport, but then also what motivates them uh, to make certain choices around food and nutrition as well. So, look at it in these three areas here. Uh, so, proactive, active, and reactive. The proactive, obviously, this is something that uh, when we show our value as dietitians, as practitioners, uh, this is something that is not easily, uh, that's not going to be easy to actually see, uh, because depending on how long you work with this athlete. In my standpoint, I get them only for three to four years with now the space of how college football is, is more so of, in a sense of, in my space here, um, in a sense of if they transfer out, maybe I may only get them for a year or two years. Or if they, you know, because of this level of play, they may actually leave within three years and that's all I have. There's so much within this space here within this age group that you have to break in bad habits. It's very hard to see the long-term effects and long-term outcomes uh, due to the fact of how the short time span that you have to work with them. So a lot of our stuff that we need to actually do is going to be seen in the active state. Uh, so from their fueling strategies from pre and post, um, then also their specific strategies around how they need to manipulate and develop body composition that's tailored toward best outcomes for sports performance, how they actually think and process certain information while they're actually playing in their sport. Cognitive performance can actually work and actually help and support your academic structure and academic team that you're working with. And then also environmental uh, preparedness. So helping them be helping them have the structure to be prepared to make the right choices and be consistent in doing so. And then also the other issue, well, not issue is um, that you got to look at in the concept is the reactive stage is always going to be part of our main jobs is to, is to work in with sports medicine, find out as far as with illness and injury and recovery, what we need to manipulate, what we need to choose, what we need to actually prescribe. Um, and I'll explain that in detail too, what you need to have. So the data points that you're going to cons consider when working with sports science, when working with uh, sports medicine, is going to be any infometric data, target weight, weekly average weights rather than a daily weight. Um, you can look at daily weights to track the progression of the individual, but try to look at a holistic view of how the weekly averages of the individual so you can and make sure you have a standard of when you are actually getting those weights so you can find out and see a true metric over time, what their weights are. Bone mineral content and bone mineral density, if you have access to DEXA, um, there are other body composition metrics as well, or assessment tools as well, BIA, so the end body analysis, um, Isaac, a standard procedure around getting skin fold measurements and looking at muscle to bone mass ratios, um, and then also using calculations to get the fat free mass index after you use those assessments as well. There's going to be subjective wellness responses, so sleep, eating habits, stress levels, fatigue, soreness, energy levels, all these data points that you're looking at here is going to be something how you can see and how you can show your value to show an outcome uh, for that individual that you're helping. Then actually seeing as far as how nutrition can support the type of injury, the intervention that's being displayed to support that injury and recovery, how it can potentially impact sleep quality and quantity, then also looking at lab values as well. And this is something that's very big on making sure that you're looking at over time 
depending on how long you're seeing that particular player or athlete over the course of time, okay, can you intervene, manage, and to have those consistent discussions around particular food items and diet strategies that's going to have an effect and seeing as far as those lap values and lap panels is affected over time with that. So the energy systems that you're going to look at here, okay, is in three different views and three different areas, if you will. And then also that book that I was telling you about the biochemical basis of um, uh, sport is going to be a great tool and resource to use to, to know and understand this stage for which sport this sport is going to fall in and which energy system is going to tap in. So anything like high intensity football, basketball, um, soccer or football, rugby, all that's going to utilize things as far as within this uh, fossil creatine system, the ATP PCR system, uh, because of the um, quick turnaround and rest, but high demand and intensity um, for movement. So, and then within that active recovery stage is when that creatine is going to be actually regenerated to continue producing ATP. Um, and then now you're going to see also anaerobic glycolysis. So you're going to see actually in some way, shape or form in team sport, such as football, it uses this energy system throughout the duration of the game, competition, practice in some way, shape or form. So how you need to manipulate and help and assist is going to be based on, okay, from what stage of participation this person is in, are they going to use uh, creatine as a source of energy within the ATP PCR system, anaerobic gly glycolysis, do they have sufficient amount of glucose available within the blood, uh, aerobic metabolism, do they have sufficient amount of glycogen stored, then also glucose and also fatty acids, so depending on how much they have as well stored to provide a sufficient amount of glucose to be able to perform on a consistent basis. And this is where also ensuring that you're looking at those amino acids, and we'll talk about this in the next one in the protein supplementation, um, how amino acids can actually help and be transformed into a source of um, energy to produce ATP and generate it in very small amounts. It may not do it a, a lot, such as what creatine supplementation will do, but potentially can support and help and make sure that metabolically speaking, you have the athlete has what they need in order to actually compete. So this is where this is a general concept of the metabolic pathways that you're seeing here um, that you need to understand as well to find out as far as which vitamins and minerals actually support an overall quantity of macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats to provide these individuals to make sure that they're looking at every stage within here to provide glucose um, and then to have that available in ATP readily available so that way they can uh, compete, but then also to have this available because if you understand the hydration component of it as well, this is where you're going to start seeing, okay, electrolytes are used for more than just retaining fluid. It's used to help make sure that they are activating and actually helping supporting metabolic processes taking place. So you have to understand that and then also take, take that consideration as well. This is why we also do those lab analyses, and this is why we also do um, those uh, nutrient analyses and those diet recalls to see how much are they having of what, so you can manipulate and instruct and educate around that to meet those needs of that player. So you have to look at it again. Six different components and areas and buckets that you have to meet to provide basically nutrients so it can have energy, the body can have energy and also can maintain health and recovery and promote growth. So carbohydrates, lipids, protein, vitamins, minerals, and actually fluid or water. So with energy, obviously that's a unit uh, of measure for energy and heat, right? So that's where we have to see that, okay, how much calories overall because calories are king or queen if you will of, of displaying and showing how much energy this person needs in order to get the job done and you can't just give a cookie cutter meal plan around this because as you see here within here even for my position groups within football the estimated daily energy intake unless you are getting more as far as specific and doing things for 
uh, like a Metabot cart or using a cute NRG or things like that that have um, an assessment, if you will, for that, uh, for RMR. And then going from there, finding out how much are they actually having an expenditure over the course of the actual participation. This is where you have to look at, okay, what position they are, how much they weigh, what the demand of the actual sport is to understand how much playing time are they having and are they truly going to need basically 4,900 calories or are they going to need less or are they going to need more based upon their position, the number of snaps, and also the demands of the actual sport based upon their actual individual position as well. So when we're addressing these caloric needs, this is where you have to look at, okay, this is the energy expenditure, this is the RMR, and including the activity level here, and then also including the stress factor as well. This is the easy standpoint of what you can provide and give to that individual and to see exactly, okay, I need to make sure that from just to keep them at bay and at rest to have sufficient energy to ensure that we're in promoting growth, recovery, and also for that individual to have enough of what they need for the demand of the practice or sport for the next day, it requires a lot. So you have to take consideration activity level and stress factor for that. Now, this is a range. It's not always going to be just a end all be all of an exact amount of what you think it is. So make sure that you're comfortable with ranges to make sure that that athlete are just meeting within a particular range, if you will, to get to where you need to be at. Such as if we were to look at weight, instead of looking at an exact number, for them to be comfortable with the day-to-day -day fluctuations, we utilize 1.25%. So that way they can see that, okay, I, as long as I'm within a particular range, two to three pounds above or below, I'm within a good target range as I'm still maintaining. And if they are in a developmental stage, then you're progressively increasing that over the course of time. Uh, looking at just three components of uh, resting metabolic rate, the thermic effect of food as well, and then also the uh, activity energy expenditure too. So this is where we're looking at this component and these key determinants that are uh, having a factor in each one of these areas, such as the activity, genetic traits, age, sex, the environmental stimuli is very important as well, because depending on that individual, a certain environment will cause a certain stress level as well. So the thermic effect of food, so depending on the composition of the plates, if you will, that they're consuming, um, their, their age group, their physical activity day to day, whether they classify as obese, I'll be very careful and I will highly suggest not utilizing BMI to classify the individual as obese and you making a decision based on that. Because I have, a, even if, you're using depending on what sport that you're playing, it will not fit and it does, it's not suitable as the best thing. That's why your tools that you're using for in-body, uh, lean mass to fat mass ratio, the DEXA scan are, are going to be your better tools to use around that. Okay. Um, insulin resistance as well. And then also RMR, depending on how much lean mass that person has, how much fat mass that person has, Obviously, male or female age and also genetic traits will also have a factor around this too. All right, so um, for our, our carbohydrates, okay? Obviously, as you know, there's four calories per gram consists of carbohydrates and oxygen. So the, the foods also uh, that consist of the, the carbohydrates that's needed, it's fruit, vegetable, grains, dairy, legumes. Uh, this is gonna be in the form of glucose and blood and glycogen that's stored in the muscle and liver. And then it was recommended this is where I, uh, I would recommend kind of moving towards in this direction of, okay, you have your calories. Yes, look at it as in a range, but now you got to start seeing the demands of the sport. This is where you got to start seeing, basically, if I have um, someone that is more so of a uh, long distance runner, um, endurance, uh, something of a, uh, a bout of activity that requires more than an two hours of work consistently, uh, this is where you got to kind of start connecting with them on, okay, maybe you need a higher end of having uh, eight to 12 grams per kilogram, if you will. So, or six to 10 grams per kilogram when it comes to going lower within a team sport 
perspective, such as football, this is where we start looking at, okay, this individual potentially may need six to 10 because it's in, it's in short bouts of high intensity, um, but they also are, and, and it's full contact, if you will, but they potentially maybe not need the eight to 12 because of the amount of snaps that they're having in that game. So thinking of it that in that fashion. So this is a great table to kind of see and look at of seeing, okay, well, how long is this duration of the sport? Um, what is the intensity of the sport? Okay, how many grams of carbohydrates in the range of uh, three to five, five to seven, six to 10, eight to 12, based upon the demands of the actual activity in itself too? Because you have to see that because even the carbohydrates that's provided, uh, the stress and the adrenaline that's, that causes an increase, carbohydrate availability is very important just for these signals to take place in order for muscle protein synthesis to take place and energy availability to be there. Um, and then also for ATP to basically move to where it needs to go to create energy and muscle contraction. So this is where you have to respect that fashion and that nature as well. And then also making sure that insulin is available too to ensure these processes are taking place. So with protein, uh, that's one of our other macronutrients, obviously, as you all know. So this is where we start looking now into, okay, from the, the profile of the protein source, what amino acids are actually displayed there. Uh, so with that being said, uh, what essential amino acids that cannot be synthesized from basically the ratios that's being provided within amino acids that's in there. And then also looking at how much leucine, because leucine is very is a very important uh, amino acid for the building blocks of muscle protein synthesis to take place as well. And then also have other roles within basically blood clotting, fluid balance, hormone production, enzyme production. Uh, visual processes and also uh, transporting other nutrients as well and cell repair. So we have to make sure that we're having um, an abundance and also we're being consistent on what amino acids are present. This is where the recommendation, we were taught 0 0.8, but you have to recommend for optimal recovery of the individual. Protein needs, needs to be met first and you strategically get around, okay, and how many feedings and sittings ideally, but then also realistically that this player can meet. Can they hopefully get between 1.8 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of total body weight, if you will. So now also this is where you have to, Look in this part because with insulin being available, it has to be available in order for mTOR to, to be present within that mTOR pathway to signal nutrients, um, seeing what energy is available and also growth factors to regulate this process. Uh, and then also to basically um, have protein translation, autophagy, ribosome biogenesis, and also cell proliferation. So insulin like growth factor one, how it's binded, and then also how insulin is there within the receptor of the cell membrane, basically leading to the phosphorylation of those certain things to activate other transport processes. So that way, muscle protein synthesis can take an effect. So this is where you have to consider that and look into those things as well. And then this is where we also need to not um, just take it for granted lipids. So yes, they provide nine calories per gram, but it is involved in a lot of factors. This is where we try to promote and educate our athletes to focus on those omega-3 fatty acids as much as possible. Because with omega-3 fatty acids, you can have improved performance, enhanced recovery, and also reduce the risk of illness and injury. Because it can have an effect in all these things as well. How the muscle's health is there, neuromuscular function, immune function, oxidative stress, exercise-induced, bronchitis, and also traumatic brain injury, which this is a staple within, especially for those athletes that are in full contact sports um, and any type of risk of fall uh, and also any type of 
quick rotation of the head that will cause a TBI or concussion, if you will. This is where also, if you don't have enough as far as fluid, but also electrolytes present, this is where everything else cannot take place as effectively and efficiently as you desire as a practitioner or you try to instruct and educate uh, your athletes to have. So with that being said, because it can reduce cerebral blood flow, it can reduce leg blood flow or blood flow to your extremities. So obviously it's going to reduce performance or have an impact on performance. And then also cardiac or systemic blood flow as well. Uh, so with that being said, that's where you have to instruct and educate depending on the environmental factors uh, and then even altitude or travel, if you will. Uh, all this has to be instructed and please consider this while you are talking and educating as far as your players and athletes, uh, because how much fluid is there is gonna have an influence on how the brain operates and how the brain actually functions in sport um, and how efficient as far as their endurance capacity is going to be. Obviously you still need that, even if it's a, even if it's wrestling or even if it's football or even if it's soccer, you still need to have that type of energy system happen effectively and efficiently and you have to reduce as much as possible the sensation of fatigue. And that will happen as long as the individual is adequately hydrated as well. So this is a great uh, position paper as far as on nutrient timing to look more into further resources and references on carbohydrate refeeding, uh, the timing of even ergogenic as far as age, if you will, and then actually ensuring that you're looking at um, as a priority carbohydrates and protein in certain sittings and the time frame of doing that. Because also the time frame could be different and you have to take in consideration their training schedule. They could train in the morning and then have another practice in the evening. So you have to make sure that you're providing enough and sufficient amount of carbohydrates and protein in the right type that doesn't interfere um, with their digestive system that may cause any type of sensation to go to the restroom in the middle of uh, the actual demand of the sport or uh, in a sense of they don't have enough and they're not feeling well enough because they weren't able to eat enough, but you got to find things that are easily digestible to do so. Uh, because you want to, everything that we're doing within sport, training, the stress, um, it's all going to be a catabolic stage. So obviously it's, it's sending a demand and it's sending a signal to uh, have glycogen be broken down to glucose and then provide energy. So where it takes energy though, you have to have energy available in order to have the anabolic stage take place as well. So this is where this has to take an effect and the timing of this takes an effect. And also the pairing of carbohydrate and protein needs to happen too to support the anabolic stage and glucose being available to not only restore glycogen, but also most of protein synthesis to occur. So now energy availability. Okay, so this is now where we're touching on what happens when you don't have enough energy available. Um, energy available equals energy intake minus uh, exercise energy expenditure divided by fat-free mass. Okay, so, so with that being said, uh, you have to ensure that if you don't, if you do not, uh, if the athlete doesn't have a sufficient amount of energy intake available, if you will, this is where you run risk of basically red S that's going to come with the next stage. So anything that is essentially less than 45 calories per kilogram, if they're not consuming at least 45 calories per kilogram fat-free mass per day, that's where you're running risk of red S, um, a potential uh, consideration of seeing red S. So you want to avoid as much as possible. It says avoid less than 30, but I'm be real honest with you try to make sure that this individual is meeting upwards to the 45 and you have to strategically manipulate the macronutrient profiles to meet the needs for um, muscle protein synthesis, for protein recovery, for muscle recovery, but then also to the point to where you're not overfeeding carbohydrates to where you're intervening with Actually, yes, you're restoring the glycogen storage, but if you have an excess amount of energy available, it has to store it elsewhere and it stores it, it continues to store it. So that's where you see that increase of weight and that's where you may see that increase of adipose tissue as well.
Absolutely. So this is where you use the range now. So obviously, so try it says 30 to 45 kilo, uh, kcals um, per kilogram of fat free mass. But to be on the safe side, so that way, especially if you have endurance runners, marathon runners, if you will, don't go at the floor in the basement of the bare minimum of 30 kcals per kilogram. Try to effectively and efficiently use maybe like 35 to 45 and use a range for them, if you will, um, to ensure they're, they're having energy available of the skeletal muscle mass. All right. So uh, this will be a great review to look at as well when you're looking at relative energy deficiency in sport. Because uh, with that being said, that when there's not enough energy. You're going to have menstrual irregularities. Uh, decreased bone density, immune function, and also impaired cardiovascular function. So looking at this is seeing that, okay, when I have, if these are signs and signals that your team as a whole can actually look at um, what that actual red S or that low energy availability or that low dietary intake can have an effect, especially when it comes to the endocrine system, because this has a large impact on that, that endocrine system was, will, is what drives our recovery. And it is also a driving factor in how we perform as well and how all these processes take place that affects that athlete's performance, recovery, and then also just their health day to day. Um, because as you see there, obviously within the male female athlete triad. So that was one thing that was missing was the male component of it, because that's one thing, there's a stigma that males don't have this uh, or that they don't experience this, which is not actually true at all whatsoever. So this is where we have to look at it as well within the standpoint of it can affect the endocrine system. And then also that's severe of a, of a, of a, of a um, calorie deficit intentionally and also having red S or low energy availability will cause this to happen. Reproductive function, bone health, so stress factors, stress reactions, anything like that or whatsoever can be a sign of that, typically. Um, uh, immune dis uh, irregularities, metabolic dysfunction, growth and development, uh, you know, that being stunted in those stages being stunted, uh, gastrointestinal dysfunction, and looking at that as a whole. So when we're looking at this, this can disrupt as far as just even behaviorally, so increase risk of injuries. It will decrease performance and muscle strength. It will also have a decrease in concentration and training response. So these players will do all this training, all this practice, all as far as this resistance training to grow and develop, but they're not eating enough. They're interrupting that cycle and interrupting that entirely. So basically they're, they're wasting that workout. They're wasting that learning experience from the sport itself. And also with that being said, from a psychological component. So because the demand of the sport and then also because it's competition, this will be helpful when they can process the information and process the sport is taking place. This can be very and extremely helpful for them to meet their energy needs due to the fact they can handle all the emotions that they need to experience in order to embrace that sport that they love to play because they're going to have failures. They're going to have upsides to it. They're going to have successes. So you got to, uh, they have to eat enough in order to make sure that they are processing everything and being coached can also be an emotional experience too. So the physiological demands as well is one thing, because if you don't eat enough, obviously glucose is not going to be available, blood pressure, resting metabolic rate, everything's going to be low. Hormonal disruption is going to be low from that point. And then also certain lipids will be high as well, which can interfere with also blood flow and also um, uh, recovery as well. So this is a, another great paper because there was is a paper on the nutrition and its impact on injury, on injury and rehabilitation. Um, so with that being said, this is you have to make sure that you're looking at, okay, if an injury has taken place, understanding the processes and the demands of what's being a, a called for in the situation because you have protein catabolism and you have an increase as far as demand for amino acids that need to be available because of the fact of the hormonal response that takes place, increased catabolic hormones, that's regular that's seen there in, within the blood, and it will decrease the anabolic hormones as well and decrease the anabolic stage for the success of the athlete to recover. So if you're having an increase in inflammation, increased energy demands, an increase in glucose demands, and an increase in temperature, 
obviously that person needs to consume more food and more energy because the key concerns of that is going to be muscle atrophy, reduced muscle protein synthesis, a development of anabolic resistance, and also loss of strength and proteolysis as well. So you have to target calories, protein, amino acids, carbohydrates, uh, fatty acids, omega-3s. And you, this is where you do not shy away from supplementation. This is where you look at those that are third-party tested, those supplements that have sufficient research to support and back it, and those supplements. And if you will, there's some things that's in its early stages, but still can provide some benefit as well because it has some other key nutrients that are available, amino acids in there too, that help with the recovery stage also for that individual. Creatine, HMB, hydroxymethylbutyrate, omega-3, focusing on DHA, vitamin D, probiotics, and a multivitamin. Probiotics is a very is a, one of those supplements that is highly underrated because the gut flora and the digestive system of an individual, if that is not in a healthy stage, then the bioavailability of a lot of these nutrients will not be as desirable. So you will not absorb and you will not mobilize and you will not utilize those nutrients as effectively as the individual needs. So this is where the timing and prescribing those interventions take place and breaking up basically uh, those things of protein, carbohydrates uh, within their stages and looking at, okay, what is the time of your rehab? What is the time as far as from, are you going doing any other issue, uh, not issues, but are you doing anything else that is considered part of your rehab and making sure you're timing this because timing is everything the type of meal that needs to take place, protein and complex and carbohydrates. And if it needs to be a light meal before surgery. And this is where we have to get into the, in the mindset of they, not they, sorry. There are a lot of physicians still prescribe it in the sense of with before surgery to not eat anything at all whatsoever. But honestly, the best thing to do for that individual is for the individual to have some essential amino acids available prior to surgery. We have the best outcome of that recovery and the best outcome of that wound to heal. So, and then strategically staging as far as the amount of protein of what the individual can actually absorb in that state between breakfast, a snack, a lunch, a dinner, and then before bed, and then looking at, okay, when rehab is available, having some essential amino acids, having some HMB, maybe potentially some creatine, and then also some carbs available too. So even within, so there's a lot of research, even I know some people still probably shy away from that as far as when it comes to search supplements, especially the creatine, but a lot of the not a lot of the information that was those things that were uh, causing that I do not want to provide this individual this because of this have been debunked uh, within that. This is why this is a great resource there and I can send any other additional resources as well for that. So this is where you have to look at for, for what I see as the fundamentals when it comes into looking at a nutrition as a whole and introducing your nutrition processes to um, your athletes is looking at, okay, for protein intake, eating that first. 1.8 to 2.2 grams per kilogram, total body weight minimum. And then also looking at as far as for each meal, this is where you look at each meal now. Ideally, what can they utilize and what can they uh, absorb in one sitting? 0.3 grams per kilogram, if you're looking at it in that fashion. So you want them to fuel for work required. So obviously three hours before the game, three hours before practice, anything intense in that, na in that nature, having the large bolus of carbohydrates in that meal. Uh, so that's one to four grams per kilogram within that meal, okay? And now on a daily total, so at the minimum should be four to six, if you, if you will. And this is gonna help you look at, okay, if I'm looking at between 35 to 45 uh, calories per kilogram, what is the ratio of each carb, protein, and fat that should make up those calories? So this is just a, just a way to look at it in that way and dialing it in that fashion. To start your timing clock of when to consume certain food, you have to educate as little as it sounds for the individual to eat breakfast and to focus on protein during that breakfast, because protein is one of the hardest things to get strategically throughout the day, because it provides so much satisfaction and satiety within the digestive system that you don't want to eat a lot 
but the more protein that you get, you have to train the gut to be able to digest this and handle this efficiently, effectively too. So you have to start them early. You have to start them as far as to be able to eat and meet their protein needs. But then also you have to find out when their training and practice times are too. You have to meet hydration needs as well. All right, five to seven milliliters per kilogram of fluid daily. So, and then get them in a the habit of weighing themselves out. Knowing what their weight is before they go into a session, weigh themselves out after for every pound that they lose is 16 to 24 ounces of water. And then also sodium, 400 milligrams to 600 milligrams of sodium as well. So you do not want to uh, take for granted also potassium and chloride in this scenario too, because of that sodium potassium pump as well. And this is something we'll go over a little bit later. We, yes, we want to focus on sodium, but you don't want to just forget about the other electrolytes that help this fluid retention and fluid motility, if you will, okay? So then also you have your supplements daily that you may want to consider and look at, zinc, magnesium, uh, specialized promodulators, vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids, nitrates, creatine, caffeine, and sodium bicarbonate is something as well. And we'll go over this too in a later uh, discussion on supplements. And then actually staying within the target weight range for that individual. And this is why I mentioned earlier, keeping it into a sense of 1.25% above or below the target weight and ensuring where you're seeing them on a consistent basis that ideally you want them to say to focus on, on weighing within this range. If they're in developmental stage and you want to adequately see them develop, looking at two pounds, uh, one to two pounds every week, if you will, is a good way to make sure that, okay, they're putting on lean mass and not body fat and you're doing your end body analysis, but then also you can incrementally move that target body weight, that target weight, and they can still stay within a particular percentage based on that target body weight as well. And if you have anything at all, this is where you can follow me. If you haven't already on any information that you need on my social media channels, I post a lot besides my family and kids. I post a lot of my family and kids. So I love them dearly. But then also I post a lot of stuff and share resources from other practitioners and other spaces, strength conditioning, sports medicine, uh, sports psychology, especially sports nutrition. Um, and, it's, and it's all random as well. So, and then these are the references also to look into further uh, that you want to look at from that I highlighted from the presentation too.